meeting and per the meeting open. Um, so, we will uh, ask for declarations of interest by individuals in relation to any items on the agenda. There's a potential for planning. Anyone who's a member of the Liverpool City Planning Committee might seek to make a, a, de a declaration. No. Uh, so, um, other than that, uh, I'm not seeing anybody. Any additional items? I'm not aware of any. And items of business which need to be moved around in the agenda, I'm not seeing them. Minutes of the previous meetings are circulated. Are those agreed, colleagues? Yes. Thank you. So we move on to the meat of the agenda. Uh, item three, outcomes from consultation. Croxford and entry fire stations, pages 11 to 84, Chief. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, detail here, sort of both, and then I'll go into a bit more details around the, the consultation outcomes. Uh, the Pearson report is to inform members of the outcome of the 12 week public consultation regarding the draft proposals to combine entry across the fire stations into a new superstation, uh, including the development of a training and development academy and National Resilience Centre of Excellence at a new site on Long Parade in Entry. Uh, and the recommendations specifically are that members note the outcome of the com comprehensive and informative public consultation process uh, undertaken in response to the proposals. Uh, and particularly take that into account when considering the formal planning application uh, for the long range site report, which is on the agenda today, including, as I say, the development uh, of the development academy and the National Resilience Centre of Excellence. Uh, well, I would say in, in, in regards to the, the details, 12 week public consultation process commenced on the 15th of July and concluded on the 7th of October. Page 12 of the report for paragraph 4 5. Uh, you know, details firstly the appendices of what was being considered by uh, the public and a more extensive group of individual stakeholders. Uh, the consultation plan uh, included an online questionnaire, which I'll refer to in, in just a second. Three, externally facilitated delivery forums by opinion research, uh, independence of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service, uh, with residents of entry, residents of Croxton, and then an old Merseyside group that was a control. Uh, three open public meetings, two online and one face-to-face at the quarters, headquarters, an external stakeholder meeting, um, and several staff and individual stakeholder meetings, including uh, three opportunities for the ward councillors in the affected areas to be uh, part, part of the discussions and form of the proposals uh, moving forward. The consultation document was also sent to uh, local members of parliament, Exercise Police Chief Constable, North West Ambulance Service, Police Fire Commissioner, City Legion, uh, Mayor Steve Bodrum, uh, City Legion, uh, and leaders, local ward councillors, democratic services, and each of the five local authorities. And the plans have also been discussed at length with uh, the City Legion leaders and the Mayor of, of the City Legion and the Mayor of Liverpool, uh, and stakeholders included those businesses surrounding the those sites in, in Long Road. Drawing those that, that comes to consultations to a conclusion, particularly focusing in, in the first instance around uh, the focus groups. Uh, so, those deliberative focus groups will be brought uh, 41 individuals together to consider the direct implications and uh, probably a greater understanding than, than most. Um, you know, as I, I kind of hosted most of them myself, in fact, all of them. Um, you know, initially, you know, start off with a, a Exploring the kind of proposals, uh, based some small concerns around uh, the road network, but broadly, you know, in, in agreement with proposals that were put forward uh, at the at the offset. But by the conclusion of the actual uh, events themselves, there was overall uh, support for three uh, focus groups, overwhelming support of proposals to combine ancient crops with uh, fire stations and going to combine into a super station at long way. In regards to and some comments there which you captured on page 16, which you know reference the kind of positivity from the group. The online questionnaire, 47 responses, 78 percent, 37 47. I believe that's reasonable for the fire to make the proposed changes. Uh, and then the 100 percent supported the inclusion of community facilities within uh, the, the new proposals. Then there's some comments around what they would be looking for in regards to the proposals themselves. You know, comments about being similar to the building, so on massive environmentally for friendly facilities. They're referencing the, the, the extensive use of community facilities, 
a baby for each group, including Jupiter Andrew, and you can give them five cadets, so they parents wanted that to be instilled in the new site. Uh, and the, that the actual the, the facility itself should be a bold statement like no other and flagship for the organisation again, which we will go on to talk about if we talk about the planning proposals in, in the next um, report. Notwithstanding, obviously, the external kind of stakeholder engagement, the engagement with the public uh, through the delivery forums and the three sessions that we've done. Uh, we've also had internal dialogue with the trade unions uh, and the South Africa trade unions have, have, have primarily in, in, in their responses concerned about the displacement of uh, people, how it affects individuals, given the fact that the changes haven't been enacted as yet. Um, we're providing reassurance that they would all be factored in and considered at the time, much akin to the, the changes that we're making now at Kerdale and Croft have announced new changes which have been very well received by uh, the representative bodies and how they've been managed and how they've been managed effectively with no or little displacements of staff outside of these the operations. And then we move on to kind of the, the engagement with the staff themselves. So I've, I've spoken to you know, crews at Croft for energy, given the fact that they are particularly affected by this uh, and you know, there was a summation of their views on page 19. So that the crops are thrilled by the variables and other policy opportunities that the new training facilities will provide. And to staff record the potential improvements in response time, and you get this uh, particularly benefiting from quicker response times during the night, and of course the new training facilities themselves. And then in totality both both stations welcomed the equation of two old one fit uh, not no longer fit for purpose stations and welcome the new facilities that will be provided both for the community uh, and staff themselves, particularly around uh, sort of the, uh, the, the equality related matters. So in the broader sense uh, and, and the documentation, the consultation itself, the RFP uh, and the, the feedback that we've received from ORS, the delivery the form, alongside the quality impact assessments, is there for members to, to consider in regards to the, the outcomes but in, in, in trying to kind of sum up uh, the responses from the public and stakeholders, you know, very, very positive around the, the proposals that were put forward to create a new superstation at Long Lane, improve response times, improve, improve the number of uh, appliances available from that particular site, uh, irrespective of the combination of the two previous sites. So there'll be more fire engines there, quicker response time, uh, very, very uh, positive in their responses. And overwhelmingly support the proposals being put forward, uh, notwithstanding the kind of comments that are made and the, the observations that people have made, potentially down the road network, but that will be dealt with the, from the planning considerations also. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you. This is a once in a hundred year decision for the commission, a decision depending on what, what, what we make today that will leave a legacy of function uh, for the authority, <laughs> whoever whoever the authority is uh, in the future, and will serve to improve the safety of our crews and the safety of the public of Mansi side, and continue to make us ever more professional and standing ever higher on the national stage. But we have to consult with those communities, both where the fire stations are at present, where we will move Houses can move to one another, and the wider uh, public community center can be served. Questions, members? Yes. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Well, I, I support the recommendation, and I know we're not going into the details today of this specific planning application, but I just wanted to seek an assurance that with the COP26 conference going on at the moment, and the whole question of the environment being the top of everybody's agenda. Are we satisfied that this new fire station will be as environmentally friendly as it possibly could be? Yes, it will be. The, the, the next report that you will consider will be the, the formal plan application proposal, which will go you know, in, in the next possibly present a report uh, through my advisor and, and, and Stuart Woods are here and available to answer some of those specific questions around what the station will look like, what the facilities look like, what you know, the environmental considerations and so on and so forth. That will be dealt with through the planning. Um, and, and this, the best this report is specifically around consultation in the first instance, because I want to be assurance that you know, the environmental 
considerations will be embraced by Merseyside Fire Service, not only because we would want the building to be environmentally friendly, but we also know that some of the risks that are emerging for fire medical services are directly attributable to climate change. So wildfire increases, flooding increases, and hence the reason why we are looking to, to enhance the capabilities of the train facility to deal with those particular issues uh, directly. Thank you, Jeff. And, and as we extract from Aintree and Cotsup as well, there's the legacy issue of what those sites are going to be used for. And this is all part of you know, our social responsibility as well. Uh, and uh, in that respect, uh, as, as, we, as we design the building, we're not going to react with that. There is a social responsibility uh, with that as well. Hi, thanks. Um, I am in favour of the proposals, but how are we going to safeguard um, the response times for Croxton if it, it's moving? You know, but where they would have had, you know, it would have been just down the road before. How, how are we safeguarding that within the plans? The, so, what the plans sort of are in at the macro level, the major side level, when we adopt the proposals, if they are endorsed and we go through the plan and then we'll agree it and then. Extension is created. We'll see us even two seconds quicker across the whole of Merseyside. That doesn't sound very significant amount uh, in the first instance, but if we consider that just in the entry and crop the air footprint, we're actually 34 seconds quicker. So the, the proposals make us quicker to respond to incidents um, across the, that, the, the entry and crop the footprint. What I would say is, like anything, if you are moving a fire station from one community a little bit further away, that community is going to be. I would see a, a slightly slower response time, but it could still be you know, well within uh, the quickest response time to cross the other side of the month because of the geographical locations. But what the intention is to do is, as we are in, in, in Council of Ireland's reference to the legacy we create and the legacy we leave behind, uh, we are going to ensure that the, the communities that we are moving a little bit further away from are provided with extensive preventative work, so home fire safety checks, no alarm installs. Uh, just to ensure that we are leaving them in, in the right manner. But also, really, is we are focused in on not only at the safe table legacy on the new site of Long Way, on the you know, move from the five acre site to the 12 acre site, particularly Crockford, the then she's the footprints are slightly, slightly different. But we know the cut the current footprints of Crockford is in the region five from two acres, um, and the potential for us to ensure that we are leaving the legacy behind as well as creating one is, is at the forefront of one mind. So, and whilst in that part of Coxton, which is an urban area, um, we're used to, they're used to the attendance that they've had, speed, uh, waiting time. Uh, in the national context, we are, there's nobody anywhere near us in terms of, of, you know, because we have full-time firefighters, and that's what makes the difference. People aren't on call, you know, half an hour to get to a fire, um, you know, urban area, however it is. So um, you, you've heard the reassurances, and of course, we'll know once <laughs> the stations have been moved what the average attendance times will be uh, from the new station into those communities. Uh, but the prospect is it will be hardly any different as what we're being told. And there's other measures that could be put in place to maintain uh, you know, speed and weight of attack, and that's what it's all about. <laughs> Um, just in terms of the consultation, I thought it would just be easy to kind of say it wasn't a very thorough consultation, so I'm grateful that the parents have been put into also to partners. And um, it does seem to highlight a couple of areas where there's been a, a misunderstanding around certain issues. So I suppose we might seem to be mindful of the communication going forward. So if we do go forward with the application, uh, be mindful of keeping that communication and being with the public and partners going forward and make clear what's coming. Um, but I just thought it would be easy to say good for a consultation. Any other, well, obviously we've got the next stage here uh, about the actual uh, planning application, but on the consultation, are there any other questions, points, observations? Can that report be uh, agreed, members? Agreed. Thank you. So we move on to item four on the agenda, formal planning application for the long range site, pages 85 to 178. Thank the intention will be to, to give members a, a presentation, so we'll move through some slides, which will give you a, a little bit of a feel for what the, uh, 
new focus station and training facility will look like alongside the Max and Lunar Centre of Excellence. So, then our notice for them to prepare for that. But the pace of the report is to request that members consider the contents of this report, having previously considered the associated consultation report, which is a separate item on the agenda, prior to uh, seeking their approval to submit a formal planning application uh, to uh, progress the site at Long Way. And the specific recommendations are that members note the progress um, of the proposed plans for the new multi pump super stations, Train Grants Academy, National Building Centre of Excellence at Long Way. Note this is an IMP proposal uh, and it will increase the number of fire plants that's available, that's available at the new station and the cross near side. Um, approve the submission of the formal planning application for Long Way to the Appendix B. Uh, having considered the outcomes of the consultation process in relation to the combination of entry and crops with fire stations. D notes that following the consultation, formal planning application process, further report will be submitted to the authority which will deal with the outcome of the planning application process and include the full cost breakdown uh, of, the, of the project prior to seeking final authority approval. And then finally, note the ambition of the service and the strengthening of the position as the need for national resilience as a basis of this proposal. I'll play pause at that point, Chair, for May, and I'll ask them to, to step up and give them a, a little bit of an, an overview of how, what we are talking about. And you did describe it as a once in a lifetime opportunity. I actually agree with that. And, and members will be, will be clear this is the opportunity to move from a confined five acre site to a significantly improved 12 acre site. and ensure that the facilities are financially improved, facilities for communities are improved, and we are able to train against emergent and foreseeable risk. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chief. Right. Afternoon, members. Um, my name is Ben Ryder. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm the officer who's been privileged enough to be the project manager for the scheme at Long Lane. Um, what I want to try and do today is um, give you a very brief background into where we are currently, why we want to move to Long Lane, and then orientate you around the site at Long Lane using some uh, mass and drawings and some concept drawings. Um, I work hand in glove with uh, Mr Woods, who's our head of estates, and we really try and complement each other in terms of our skill sets from the operational perspective of what we're trying to achieve and then the estate's perspective, which you've already touched on, councillor, around what we want to do for the environment, sustainability, and all the other important issues raised. Okay, so, what, what, why? Why are we looking to move to Long Lane? Um, and what, why do we want to develop a new trade and a development academy and a search and rescue super station? Well, our new values state that our vision is to be the best fire and rescue service in the UK. And if we want to be the best fire and rescue service in the UK, we need the best infrastructure and facilities to be able to deliver against that ambition. We need to be able to equip our firefighters and all of our, our staff with the ability to serve our communities and meet uh, our response standard against foreseeable risk. How are we doing that? Well, the authority has, all, uh, has already approved what, what I believe is our most forward thinking and ambitious IRNP to date. You know, the last iteration of the IRNP improve the number of appliances we had available and this IRMP 21 to 24 further improves our operational response standards and enables us to meet our risk across Merseyside in terms of our response standard to our communities. Where are we currently? Chief's already stated, entry was built in 1926. We could spend an awful lot of money trying to bring the facilities at entry up to standard and it just still wouldn't be practical. Um, we've done an accessibility audit through our 
estates team with our ED and I officer. Uh, it's not accessible. It's not got community facilities, and it doesn't need them. Doesn't doesn't meet the needs of our diverse workforce in the way we would want it to. Cropstick, although it was built a little bit later, is similar. It doesn't provide us with the infrastructure that we need for our search and rescue team. It doesn't have community facilities. And again, it would need some significant investment to be able to uh, bring it up to standard. The site of Croxteth, um, we've all got fond memories of it. It served us very well. However, you can see it's landlocked. We've got a cemetery one side, we've got a school another. And again, we would have to invest an awful lot of fiscal resource to get it up to a standard. And that standard still wouldn't enable us to train against foreseeable risk. And I don't think we'll give our staff or our communities the facilities they deserve. That leads us to Long Lane. Sites at Long Lane would improve our operational response standards. It's significant in terms of its size. So it's 12 acres. It would enable us to use the spatial planning for the site really efficiently and effectively and create a search and rescue superstation, four bays with the size and the facilities that we require to deliver our search and rescue capability. Also, We've got a good track record in building fire and rescue stations. We've done it on Whittle. We've done it at St. Helens. We've done it at Prescott. And each time we're learning and the stations will be get, becoming better in terms of its environmental sustainability, but it also in terms of the facilities for our diverse workforce. What came out quite strongly in the public consultation is they want us to continue delivering our youth engagement provision. So we will have a state-of-the-art facility purposely designed to deliver our youth engagement um, programmes of which we've got many and are very, very effective. That's one component part of the project. Another component part of the project is the TDA main building. Um, again, really come out in terms of the public consultation that they wanted an iconic building. They wanted something that would offer um, the communities of Merseyside the facilities that it deserves. So this is a state-of-the-art educational training facility. If you think of the Training and Development Academy, all of our staff go through the Training and Development Academy. Our role as Lead Authority for National Resilience and our ambition to build on that relationship with Home Office and build a National Resilience Centre of Excellence. Again, we need to be able to have state-of-the-art sector lead and facilities to be able to do that. That showering facilities, that's classrooms, that's conferencing facilities, and it needs to be an environment that's conducive to learning. At the heart of the building will be our National Resilience Centre of Excellence. This will host our staff from NRAT, staff from ISAR, and also our secondary fire control. Again, you know, I'm looking at members, I think this is its own concept visuals, but if we are hosting other fire and rescue services or ministers or our communities, it will be a state-of-the-art facility and it embeds national resilience into the DNA of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service. Important point that the council had touched on earlier and, and, a, and an area that Stuart is, uh, is very keen on us making sure that we're leading the way on the sustainability and the environment. So we will be utilising a number of 
uh, emerging technologies in order for us to meet our ambitions to be carbon neutral for the site at some point. Um, Stuart, I don't know if you want to come in here and give a, a, an, an overview. Yeah, I think it's purely important when you're looking at the biological diversity of the sites, so there will be a staff wellbeing garden, there will be an extensive landscaping scheme that's put into the sites as well. We are looking to 2050 to be net zero, but as you know, technologies now will change between now and 2050. So it's key for us as an authority to make the site flexible enough to change the site as we go forward. Albeit the last three stations have been very environmentally friendly built, this one will improve on that. So there'll be heat pumps put in there for decarbonisation, underfloor heating in the appliance space, which is something new. A cedar roof on the glass front of the station, but also the infrastructure will be put in now for electric vehicle recharging points to meet um, 10% of the car park spaces now, but also allow us to build on that in the future. But we've got to be careful that it's probably 20 years before, between now and 2050, and technology will change. We need the site to be flexible enough and adaptable enough so we can change with technologies and improve the sites as well as well. So we're trying to build up all of that within the scheme now. I think as well we will leave, we will have a, a well-being garden for our staff. We've led the way in terms of mental health and we want to create an environment that's conducive to learning from where we our staff want to go and want to uh, want to be. So I've touched on the station and I've touched on the main building. We've got a lot of experience and building fire and rescue stations, we've got a proven track record with it. Um, riders and weights have got an awful lot of experience in building state-of-the-art educational settings. The bit that has brought the world of architecture and construction together and merged it with our expertise as a fire and rescue service. And for me, the creative bit in some of this has been the spatial planning for the training zones for us to be able to meet our needs to train against foreseeable risk. How have we done that? We've had a project management structure in place. We've had support from our strategic leadership team and the executive sponsor, Mr. Sale. Um, we've had regular project boards, which has brought all thematic leads together. Our quality and diversity officer is on the project board, our health and safety manager is, our procurement manager. People from right across the service have really contributed to this vision. We've also had thematic subgroups. So uh, our national assurance colleagues have, uh, have assisted in the design and the delivery of it. We've run workshops so i suppose the point i'm trying to make here is uh, we've got a fantastic relationship with riders and all of our staff have really contributed and had a voice in helping design this site and um, so now i'll just try to orientate you around the training facilities that will be uh, hopefully building so we'll have a foundation training area as the authority knows, we've been recruiting in significant numbers. That's been so positive for us. And, um, you know, our apprentices, apprentices are among the best in the country. Um, the foundation training enables us to build those skills to be able to be much more complex, much more difficult scenarios. So it's very important that we have um, that, that, uh, those training facilities. Merseyside has a number of road networks, M62, M57, M53, and we need to be able to train against that foreseeable risk. All of our training zones will be very immersive. So it will give us a feel as if you are actually in a realistic incident. I did say to Mr. Sale, I'll get this in, that that is a foreign appliance because they have come to our center of excellence from uh, afar to be able to train with us. Uh, that, that was put in there on purpose. Um, 
I think really think when I've spoken to colleagues across the country, you know, we will have a number of people wanting to come and train with us. So we've got the road risk. We've got a rail risk, including tunnels in Merseyside. Really important to gain. We have immersive training for our staff to hold their skills against. We're a maritime city. With that comes an awful lot of positive, uh, uh, also an awful lot of positive um, trade. However, it is a significant risk for us. The L2 project has seen shipping increase significantly, and as a result, we've had to deal with some very serious incidents on the docks. Um, you know, for us to be able to train against that foreseeable risk is critical. This facility here doesn't look much, but that's for our high volume pump. So for us to be able to train with our high volume pump is absolutely critical. It, 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 it enables us to fight fires in places where we have really difficulty in accessing water supplies, but it's also a national resilience asset. So in terms of that national resilience centre of excellence, it's very important that we have that ability to trade with that key asset in terms of fighting fires and moving large volumes of water back to the climate emergency type of agenda. As you can see on the site, it's sited at the top and out the way. That's for us to be able to uh, lay the hose out across the whole of the site and use the HVP in conjunction with the other training facilities. The whole site is multifunctional and we're able to utilize lots of different training rigs and scenarios at the same time, exponentially improving uh, our ability to be able to train. So the HVP leads us into our other area, urban search and rescue. We've got an amazing track record uh, across the for urban search and rescue civil set. Um, at the back of the actual main rig, you can see a complex network of tunnels. Underneath, uh, above those tunnels will be a rubble pipe. So that will enable us to be able to train, and train again in a really immersive environment against that collapse structure risk. Um, all of our NMAT officers have really been vital in feeding in their expertise to be able to design these. And some of the comments we're getting back is they are absolutely sector leaders. We've also got a number of Comar sites and petrochemical sites and industrial sites in Merseyside. So again, to train against that foreseeable risk is very, very important. Um, all these rigs, but this one in particular, would also enable us to bring the income generation into the service because I believe that there would be quite a lot of demand <coughs> from industry within Merseyside to come and train at this state of the art facility. Probably our most risk critical area, our bread and butter, would be firefighting. Very important that we are able to train in a very immersive setting. Uh, we don't go to as many house fires as we used to because our prevention activities are so good. We, we don't go to as many fires in the built environment as we used to because our protection staff are so good. However, we need the ability to train in that immersive environment. We need the ability to train against domestic risk, but also it's critical that we are able to train against high-rise risk. So this is a six-storey high-rise facility, two stairwells, and all the infrastructure for us to be able to meet uh, all the uh, recommendations coming out of the Grenfell Tower required. This really is a state-of-the-art uh, training facility. So. All of these <coughs> trading zones are supported by a number of ancillary buildings, which are very, very important to us. Um, a 10 bay urban search and rescue garage and an 8 bay, 8 appliance bay TBA garage. These don't look very aesthetically pleasing, but these are our practical 
training classrooms. They're purposely designed to meet the training zone that they sit in, and you'll see them sat within different training zones. So that is a transport one, that's a national resilience one, and this is a BI foundation one. They are purposely designed to meet the needs of the trainer within that area. That'll act as a cultural shift for our staff. They'll have the IT equipment, the welfare provision, to be able to be fully immersed in state-of-the-art training areas, to be able to do both practical and theoretical training in all types of weather. Key to all of this, and unfortunately, apologies, I haven't got any imagery for it, would be a state-of-the-art command and control suite. Incident command is vitally important in terms of where we're going as a fire rescue service. We really need to make sure that all of our commanders are trained to the highest possible level. It's critical in terms of firefighter safety. That would be achieved through, like I said, a blue chip state of the art immersive command and control suite. As you can see, the training scenarios are amazing. It is impractical to build training routes for every single foreseeable risk. I can't build a moorland to enable us to train against wildfire. However, this facility will enable us to be able to train against it from an incident command perspective. Similar with waste fires and other things that would be difficult to create and, and would not be friendly to the environment. I think our staff have had an excellent rapport with riders and the spatial planning enables the site to be multifunctional and multi-purpose. Um, apologies, I'll just get sober slightly. The, the white area on the back also gives us the ability to further develop the site in the future. If anything, what we should have learned over the last couple of years is expect the unexpected. There are emerging risks to the fire and rescue service, but the site gives us the scope to be able to develop the site further if needed. And if you've driven past one lane, because I actually live in, in Croxton Chair, where so this is very close to me, but if you've driven a bit, uh, driven along long lane, you'll know that the uh, the site is by taskers. It's been uh, derelict or unused for decades. I think this would act as a beacon for us as a fire and rescue service, but really enhance the community um, that it's there to be able to serve. Um, Stuart, I don't know if you want to quickly touch on the social value and the apprenticeships before we move on. Yeah, it's an interesting target. So we're using Crown Commercial Services framework to a point, point through. Um, within the, the district, uh, social value impacts, I think it's about £30 million worth of social value impact in the community through apprentices to be training needs and leaving that lasting legacy both on this site and the other two sites as well just to make sure we maximise the value. I think as Ben said about the future expansion is probably about two to three acre sites at the back of the site this allows us to develop a future and there's risk to the authority as well so again the infrastructure will be put in place to allow us to quickly in the future and connect to the journey to connect to the power supply and build potentially another way or something in that area. So it's it's quite flexible and adaptable the sites. So um, hopefully members have um, have done that justice and hopefully I haven't gone on too long chief so um, open to questions but thanks for your time to be a privilege to work on it. That's what adds social value to the area. So there's a number of hotels. There's one on the National Travel Lodge on the uh, on the East Lanks Road itself. But if you think how attractive um, 
the, the Pool City region is in terms of the accommodation it offers. I think uh, a lot of people did, will be uh, choosing a number of uh, the hotels and accommodation within the area. You know, we've got really good travel networks in, and uh, I, we wouldn't be looking to host accommodation on the site. I think that would enable the uh, economic um, sort of impact on on from the site to be able to send it back in. Um, thank you for that um, uh, great demonstration. I think it's going to be a really brilliant site. Um, particularly welcome the youth engagement work because you know I know I see and obviously I've been to some benefit. That's really glad that that's included as part of the key project. Um, can I ask a question about the funding of it? So this might be for you. Um, in terms of um, obviously I know you're only at stage two, but given the fact that we've already seen costs increase a little bit and it's likely to get worse because of still costs and, and very small costs associated with building work. Are we still confident in the financial case for it, being able to make this work down the line? Here's why the first one. You go first, Ian. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, we assume a certain level of cost in the current financial plan. Obviously, that has been revised as things has come out. And the key issue is going to be you know, one part of the overall budget process, 22 23. So, the spending review will come out something in December. Council tax information after Christmas, but we will build into the budget process the latest specification cost. And overall, we will have to deliver a balanced financial plan to take into account these costs. Uh, it will be during the budget process. We've got the eyes across the teams. I think just to, to build on what I'm saying, there, you know, we are very conscious of you know, the, the escalating costs in regards to bridge infrastructure projects. Uh, what Ben's alluded to to the Greater West of the is the escalation to make this report the size of the rough bank. And he described that the white area which will lay fallow for emerging risks. Um, you know, and and you know, what we are clear on is the necessity to build a new train facility, this is necessity and the benefits of the community around the new superstation, and that you know, that income that could potentially be generated through the national resilience piece. But if we have to pay back, so in, in, in effect, we have to phase implementation. Um, over a period of years, extending beyond the IMP, and we will do that to ensure members that we are, we are not overstretching ourselves financially, but if you are, we're not setting our ambitions to, to have the best facilities in the UK and, and the fact that we best by our next service. So the aspirations remain the same, but we are very obviously when we have arrangements in place where we may factor in and progress you know, 75% and then add the additional 25% moving forward and then build on it. Again, moving forward again based on changing for a major risk. Uh, so, you know, finances will be one of the ultimate considerations for the authority once it's gone to the planet. It's been agreed and proposed, and we've got a little bit more details around common spending review and also the financial envelope in which the street change around the academy and, and station sits. Then that will be coming back to members for that approval. But the ultimate review will be, well, certainly as it stands now, as the chief officer, I will be looking at. Failing it depending on our outcome, funding wise, rather than you know, not putting in at all, uh, but very cognizant of the advantage uh, and the new case in the future. I mean, we are uh, uh, you know, yeah. going back and other than the uh, Home Office partner and uh, some capital in, most unusually. Um, so I think this, this, what we're asked for today is the predictive planning application, there will be design development. Everybody knows projects become more expensive and they overrun on time. You don't know when you dig the hole in the ground what you're going to find there. Although we've done some site uh, tests, but the fact that you know, you get wet weather, you know, and then the, 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 the overriding thing that all companies will be cognizant of is the overall economic condition of the country in a year's time. So all we can do is run with the aspiration of it. <coughs> uh, application and on design development if you need to drop things out from the that's what will happen. Uh, so I think what we're being what we're being told is that we've got uh, the ability to make a start, get the, the you know the holes in the ground and, and start construction of it and see what happens in terms of design development if we go on. My question is, like where I, I live in Harewood, we've got 
two big pharmaceutical factories there. And as you said, we've got one of them, uh, Coma, there's just things there. Um, do you do the training for the likes of the, of the pharmaceutical? I know what you said there, and also can I just congratulate you on the work that you put into that, because it looks absolutely amazing. Yeah, we, we did a number of, um, of training and testing of Comar sites. Um, so we, we do an awful lot of training there. Clearly, um, that enables us to, to be very, very good at responding to those sites. However, what this builds in is realistic scenarios. So what we don't see on the, uh, on the concept drawings is the fact that we can set fire to it. We can... Uh, we can um, do scenarios that uh, imitate spilling chemicals uh, and we're able to be able to utilise foam and, and, and other techniques in that area. So, um, yeah, absolutely, we do train against those risks. We've got comprehensive training and exercising against the, the coal mar sites. This would further improve that and expand on it. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. In coal mar operators have a legal responsibility to train and we're helping them. Yeah. And they only pay for that. They have to. And uh, we put on training we put on training days every year for Comar operators. And this would be the best thing they've ever seen. Thanks. Thank you for the presentation. I think that is really, really good cool assessment. And um, I can see lots of work gone in there and lots of people coming together. Uh, I'm really pleased about um, the community facilities that will be available um, and that you have um, looked at physical accessibility in the old building saying that they're, they're not up to the standards that everybody can stand at And um, So you're looking at future proofing, um, which again is good. Uh, just um, to let you know that the Pool Planning Department and the Inclusive Design Officer um, who will discuss uh, the details. So the, the, the minimum standards um, do not really cover the issues properly, they are minimum standards. So, if we're looking at best practice, uh, two items that I'd like to ask you to speak to the inclusive design officer about. Uh, sometimes the platform lifts are put in because uh, they look cheaper, but they're actually quite problematic. They're very unreliable um, and it's a lot of the purpose of the middle of the world is a lot of people around the issue and the use of domestic situations in. Um, and also whether the lifts um, are going in, are they going to be used for the planet? <laughs> the emergency egress, which comes up a lot in those things. It could be a matter of a huge group, it could be a future, but that's going to be a requirement in larger buildings. Um, and the other thing that you may be aware of a campaign that's been happening um, around the changing facilities. This is toilets where if somebody needs a, a, a care or personal assistant with them, that the space and that there can be a hoist in there. Just in terms of the community, that would be an excellent facility if we managed to put that in. As I say, the group design officer would be more than happy to discuss those issues with you. Brilliant. I really appreciate the, uh, the support and the advice. Our ED and I officer has been integral to the uh, to the project, and like I said, we've uh, we've conducted a number mm -hmm. of um, of visits across our whole estate around accessibility. And the report back from each of those uh, sites will be fed into this. It's the same company that are helping us with the accessibility but I really appreciate the, the support and the advice and you know, Stuart Gull as well. Yeah, uh, there is a passenger lift going into the TDA building, I think, um, and there is changing facilities for, I'm not sure if it's a hoist in it, but we can certainly look at that as we get to the architect. But we've got an accessibility auditor who's reviewing the plans now, so speak with the inclusive officer as well to come up with the best design that we can for the station. Chair, can we just carry that point there? There's a difference between changing facilities and changing places toilets. Yeah. And so if you could mention to your access officer um, that it's very specifically changing mm -hmm. places toilet rather than just like changing rooms. But they, they should be aware of the difference if you mention that to me. Yeah, just come, just come in on, on the, the comments we had first, mm -hmm. uh, and it's about wanting to be fair and that uh, best practice. And so all the fact that we're so absolutely we want to be integral part parts of the not only the station build but the, 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 the broader trend that's happening. That's where we kind of you know, that's what sets 
fine if it's not fine to set to sign. I would consider all of those kinds of things going on as well to really welcome me and the, the, the kind of comments and the uh, intrusive design officer will be the government will only be in contact with my office. One, two, three. Mate, okay. Um, and thank you for your uh, thanks very much. Very interesting. Uh, what what is the sort of the important most options to time frame for completion of the site in its entirety as they will draw into the Yeah, I think we're, we're obviously we're going to plan, and I think it's the tenth of December, Stuart, for planning. Yeah, we're going to submit planning applications just before Christmas, so it's validating. So hopefully, it all things we can. 30 weeks later, so it should be beginning of March. We should get an answer back on the planning, and then we'll come back to the authority at the beginning of June for the decision on the finance and the planning outcome. Hopefully, to look to start on site July, August next year, between probably a 70 week build program. So it could be towards the end of 2023 by the time it's fully built and operational. Quick presentation, Ben. I'm really excited to, to, to see this project. From the floor, I've heard costs and phasing in. And obviously, what comes first, the community fire station or a train facility, considering that there's money from the home office there? Yeah, I think, uh, to, to be honest, I think we would still be able to build the community fire station and the training and development academy. I think what the Chief's talking about in terms of the phasing would be how um, how quickly some of the, the training zones would come online and we, 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 we could do that on a risk basis so clearly I think from my perspective we'd go away and we, we'd do that piece of work if the financial envelope didn't enable us to do the whole build it at once but um, we're managing that through the, the project management structure um, and Stuart and I and the team are constantly challenging the uh, the cost plan as well. So the ambition would hopefully not to have to phase it, but if we did, we'd have a robust rationale behind how each of the zones came online. I hope I've explained that correctly to you. No, it's possible. Um, I think just to clarify that, we're talking about phasing. Give you an example, so we talk about... Uh, So the replacement of the fire station stands alone as a decision. To, and we've already made that decision with the authority to refresh those two fire stations. We have a training and development uh, agency at Academy, and there was a plan at one stage maybe to refresh on the same site. But uh, now th this small lane option has come along and members have been developing that. And that stands as a separate decision. But in a way, a decision, not that it's been made finally, but a planning or you know, for us a strategic and financial planning decision uh, to replace the, the TBA on the same site as the new fire station. And there's, it's a good question, it's a subtle question, but I think at the end of it, we have got to give our staff and our communities better facilities in terms of fire stations. We've got to give the country a better offer for training firefighters 
to protect the community and stay safe. We can do that here in the morning. Thank you, Ben. And it is just um, an observation. Um, just um, thrilled that uh, equality, diversity and inclusion are so embedded, were so embedded in this, um, because I think it's Merseyside Fire and Rescue's uh, ability to plan forward that has pushed them forward with equality and diversity. I know that there's some um, fire services who can't um, cope with, for example, um, women firefighters because they simply haven't got the facilities. And I think this is an example of forward thinking, particularly with the facilities um, for youth engagement, because that ethos is, is just there. It just, I don't say trickles down, but it's, it's there, isn't it? So it, it's just to say, it's, it's so good to hear. Thank you. And, um, you know, our, our staff networks have been really, really um, vital in, in helping design the, the scheme as well. So our staff really have took ownership and fed into it right from the blank canvas stage. So I'm will continue to do it as we get more technical people to design. Thank you. Just very briefly, I'm The first thing about firefighters during this, I find the search in 1990. Right, so you know, we have some way away from that 32 odd years. We've got 70 plus female firefighters now who are the end of the facilities for you know, the, the, uh, a significant part of their first time. Charging of 
forms of charging vehicles is that something that's going to be planned as well so that it has to deal with those type of fires whether that be domestically or within, within the settings it, 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 it. Lithium mine batteries and other new and emerging technologies are a real significant risk for us. That that's one of the reasons why we've got an area for future expansion as well. Um, um, Mr. Keane, before he, uh, he he retired, has done a, a, a really significant piece of work around how, as an organisation, uh, we start to respond to some of those emerging risks. So the the site being future proofed. For, for those emerging risks and others that we haven't foreseen yet is, is vitally important. Um, when we've been speaking to uh, riders and weights and the design team, what we have asked for as well, when they're putting in um, some of the new technologies, we've said, will that be accessible for our firefighters to be able to see how they work and understand them? And then in the future, we'll be able to adapt how we respond to those incidents and the techniques that we use to be able to uh, keep the communities safe when we, when unfortunately they do burst into flames or cause us issues. An example of that will be on the It's a, it's a real challenge for the yeah, sector. And the safety, the safety yeah. of the fire crews as well in dealing, you know, dealing with that and, and the type of fires that we've essentially And then green issues, are, you know, it is the issue of the day, colour of the day. Uh, and um, however, we've, we, we've worked on this for a while and we've got two aspects. You've got fire, a working fire station and people have got to come to work there and work and travel around. And procuring, that's why we have to be flexible here, procuring electric fire engines is a national issue, which I don't think has yet been sorted. Or are you going to run them on hydrogen? Are cars going to have these high pressurised hydrogen tanks within them? What are the fire service going to do in terms of you know, cutting people out of cars which have got a bomb in the boot? And there's lots of issues like that. Um, the other part of the site is a... Um, training centre which will be used nationally. People will be coming from all over the country. So one of the things that I, I, it's a question in a way, with, at the back of the site is a cycle track and it's part of the Liverpool connected cycle uh, route. Um, and again you asked a question about people staying in hotels in the, in the area and the two um, or the, the nearest railway stations are a little bit displaced. So we need to try and arrange it so that people don't have to drive one person, one car. That's never mind electric, diesel, or petrol. One person in one car, and you park it outside your house for 20 hours of the day. These are issues, as, as Natalie's a national issue, that we've got to overcome. Enabling people to arrive for their training course using public transport rather than driving. So we're going to have to look at issues about. Shuttle bus, electric shuttle bus, whatever, from the railway stations, from Lime Street, bringing people, make it easy, an easy option to not come here on a car. And um, things of that nature is what we've all got to build into it. But that, those are comments. Questions, if I may. So, Manchester rebuilt their training uh, centre completely. Didn't like it, they're doing it again. It is Manchester. Uh, so, uh, are we? Uh, are we? In, have you been over? Are you in touch with Manchester, seeing what they're doing over there? Yeah. So, um, not not just myself, but a number of, of, of staff, particularly from our training and development academy, have been visited Manchester, Cheshire, Lancashire, a number of fire and rescue services, Tyne and Weir, uh, and again, like I've said earlier, we've utilised uh, our legal authority status to be able to get um, information from other fire and rescue services in terms of the facilities that they offer through the National Resilience Assurance Team. 
So we've learned an awful lot from other fire and rescue services. Uh, what I would say is some of the, the best training facilities are on our doorstep. The likes of Cheshire have got a really good training facility. Um, I'm very, very confident in saying that this will be an awful lot better. Our car drive at the moment is three times 20. Um, Manchester time, but they're looking at 250 a year um, of new recruits. Now they're bigger than us, yes. But that's, a, I, you know, I didn't question it, I was just told this, uh, that they're, they're planning for 250 a year new firefighters. I could have explained the lot to leave, I don't know. But um, do we think that there would be a, a pressure on numbers? Is the academy going to be big enough to train? The people that we need. Well, absolutely. So th throughout the, the, the really robust project management structure that I showed you earlier, we've worked with Parisia, who before he was uh, successfully promoted to area manager, was the training and development academy manager. Work with Barry, work with all of the staff of the TDA and develop a very, very robust area schedule, which wasn't just in relation to the here and now, was future proof to look at the infrastructure that, and the facilities that we would need to be able to train or um, train at the site at its uh, absolute optimum capacity. So that piece of work has been done and been done very robustly. Um, also as well, um, I'll pinch one of Barry's phrases, um, We've used empirical data to be able to design the training rigs, but also to be able to come up with the numbers of how many people will go through it. So it's data-led, the training. It's data-led how we've developed the site. It's not been a finger in the air. I didn't want to go into too much technical detail here, but everything has a robust formula behind the design. Okay. Um, so, colleagues, if there's any other questions, points or observations, the decision that's before members today um, is to consider formally submitting the planning application to the Liverpool City Planning Authority and the Committee. Uh, the papers and rationale are there. Um, the design and the development and the, and the tendering and the rest will come later. At this stage, it's just a submission for the formal planning application. So, would members be agreeable to that recommendation as outlined in the report? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Good presentation. And as I say, you know, there's another decision yet to come, and that's the financial one. But this, in terms of moving it forward, is a very, very good uh, debate and discussion. Um, okay, so um, five PFA contract refinancing. First, this report is to inform members uh, that the new owners of the PFI contract and their building their Berger global infrastructure have initiated a scoping exercise to consider the requirements of the senior debt with the PFI contract and recommendations that members note their content to the board and agree to the sign of any refinancing deal to be delegated to the direct finance procurement. In consultation with myself and the chair of the authority, uh, so we can to the call to submit the detailing outcome of any refinancing. In effect, what we're just asking for the permission to check out to address any refinancing uh, of the refined contract and submitted to savings. And if we are able to facilitate them, uh, then we will see on the opportunity, much as into that, we would be for uh, refinancing the you know, mortgage. Uh, and again, I know members have expressed the year of the past. Is there any way we could look at our PFI uh, schedules and see whether there's options to make any savings as a result of that? But this is on the basis of the comments, but it's on the basis of the, the new owners of the PFI contract taking uh, up the bill. Financial implications are captured within paragraphs 26 to 28, and it ranges from between 450 and uh, 620,000. Uh, savings which could be procured over the period which would translate to uh, in the region of 167,600 for Merseyside uh, up to 259,874 given the fact that actually the PFI deal in the first instance was one which was created by 
three finest cachets in the Northwest region, uh, ourselves, and Cachet in Cumbria, and the money would be distributed proportionally to the kind of the amount that those states has uh, made at that particular point in time. So again, it's probably a, 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 a no-lose really situation here. If we can refinance it and the same to the we would seize on that, and that would be uh, secured and agreed by the, the, uh, the, the direct finance procurement any questions on that? It's just housekeeping there, yeah. Uh, as a paragraph 15, uh, I'm just wondering if you take an invitation and maybe you want to charge or what or something. Uh, into the, into the yeah, it's a good question. It has to be agreed by all three authorities which opportunity want to take. I think we're all indicating that we wish to take the, the one off saving uh, rather than spread up over the remaining years of the FR, which is 2038. If it's in the order of sort of two hundred thousand pounds for this authority, my intention would be to use that money to increase the TBA capital reserve to help fund previous discussions. Around meeting the, the funding of the development of the new site. Okay, so the decision is to delegate to Chief Finance Officer, enter into discussion with the partner authorities, subject to consultation with the Chief and myself, final decision to be reported back to the authority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Six. Five, uh, by the, by the pension scheme immediate detriment framework, pages 185 to Yeah, Yes, Chair. Uh, the purpose of the report is to request that members consider whether they wish to adopt the immediate detriment framework agreed between the FPU, the LGA, in order to allow eligible, retiring, and now retired by pension scheme members access to their legacy pension schemes prior the legislation being passed to remedy the eight discrimination findings in the Sergeant McLeod case. Paragraph 3 to 4 and Appendix A provide members with the background to the Sergeant McLeod pension age discrimination case and the proposed remedy for the government. Members have previously agreed to implement the Home Office immediate pension guidance that allowed eligible retiring by a pension scheme members the ability to immediately access the legacy scheme benefits. That report attached to the pending say did consider the possibility of an LDA and FDU framework, but at that time no agreement had been reached or details of any proposals were available. On the 8th of October, the LGA and FDU signed a memorandum of understanding that established an immediate debt framework to process eligible by pension scheme members. <coughs> Into the legacy schemes. Paragraph 8 to 13 of the report summarise the key points of the MOU and proposed immediate detriment framework. The MOU immediate detriment framework attached to the report to Appendix B. The key differences between the LGI and FBU immediate detriment framework and the Home Office immediate detriment framework guidance are. The immediate detriment framework can be used to process retiring eligible FPS members and those who have already retired. Eligible FPS members with certain technical challenges, such as a contribution holiday, can now be processed under the immediate detriment framework. The immediate detriment framework has identified a number of compensation payments, such as interest on underpaid pensions, that will be paid to eligible FPS members now. The immediate detriment framework has set a time frame for dealing with requests and providing pension benefit information and making payments. The immediate detriment framework significantly raises the ask of MFRA pension staff and the authority's pension administrator, LPP, by including retired members, compensation payments, and a time frame now to deal with FPS members' requests. If members wish to implement the immediate detriment Framework, officers will work with LPP to deliver the immediate detriment framework, but initially priority may be, has to be given to retiring FPS members to ensure on retirement they are in receipt of the 
intervention. Paragraph 19 and 20 outline the financial implications of the immediate death in the framework. The increase in immediate death in cases due to retired members having immediate access to the legacy benefits and the payment of compensation where applicable will add to the cost of implementing immediate death in cases. It's for each fire and rescue authority to consider whether they wish to adopt the LGI and FBU MOU and the Detection Framework for their scheme members. It is not a legal requirement. However, if members choose to adopt the immediate detection framework, it may avoid legal action against the authorities by the FBU, as they have stated that they may consider further legal action against any FRA who do, who do not adopt the immediate detection framework and the MOB. And also, by adopting the immediate detection framework and MOB, the authority, will, the authority will be using a standardised LGA approach for processing immediate detection cases, therefore future corrections of pension benefits to reflect the finalised legal and regulation changes expected in October 2023 may be determined at a national, not a local level. If members approve to adopt the media detection framework, officers will meet with the relevant union representatives to discuss the communication and implementation strategy and commence the rollout of the media detection framework. I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, Chair, I'm a little bit puzzled really by the recommendation because the, the papers of the report that we consider adopting framework agreed by the LGA and the FBU. But the recommendation just says that we consider adopting it. So if that's carried, we haven't actually adopted it. Really, shouldn't the recommendation say that members adopt the LGA and FBU memorandum? It's, it's a valid point, to, to, be, to be honest, and I think I was careful before the recommendation because of the nature of the content, and I was really up to members to see whether they wish to or not adopt the framework. I think I've tried to hint towards the end there that there are benefits if you accept the immediate protection framework in terms of avoiding further legal action and also there will be a need to correct the immediate detriment uh, framework benefits that it produces once the legislation uh, comes out in October 23 uh, but by using this national uh, immediate detriment framework there should be a standard approach to doing that. So that they are the two benefits. The flip side of it is the cost. So I, I was, I take your point. I was just trying to leave up to members to decide which way they wish to go. No the benefits against the cost. It, it, indeed, I mean this has been around for a little while and discussed at the LGA. Mm. You know, mostly in terms of trying to lobby the government to put money in. Because they're the scheme administrator, but we have to carry the can. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and um, my question is just: we put three hundred thousand pounds in uh, in the budget. What you're saying here in nineteen is it might indicate that we need to identify another three hundred thousand to on top of the three hundred thousand we put in. That that's correct. Yeah, I also understand from the home office. That their immediate detriment proposed was only for retiring members. So if the LGA agreed it, the proposal includes now retired, then that's a call for the FRA to make if they wish to extend it. That's not under the Home Office Guide, that's the LGA. So whether they would give any funding for that additional cost is in doubt. But we are hopeful that at least for the retiring members administration costs associated, associated with that, we would get some funding, but I assume we won't. So the extra 300,000 that you referred to, I'm um, confident as it stands at the moment, the next financial review report that goes to PNR in December will highlight a small favourable variance, and I will be seeking members' approval to use some of that favourable variance if they adopt the immediate detriment framework for the LGA. To, to cover that additional cost. So, so thank you. So, uh, Councillor Cain's right. The recommendation of I think it's a, is only a question. Uh, you do want to, we would have to amend that. Uh, but um, um, uh, the, the, 
at this, the decision that we're making today is if I'm right, is, is as uh, the finance officer, you're recommending us to take that decision, and the limit of our you know, estimate, the limit of what we're deciding is an additional £300,000, but subject to you know, un further unknowns. Yeah, I, I would suggest to you that, that if we do not accept the framework of the funds of group and the FBU start legal action, I would imagine that the cost of, of that action for the authority would probably be equal to or close to that additional cost. So I think in the incentive and if you do in that, if you don't, and it might be better to accept the framework because there are benefits then of avoiding legal action. And also the, the benefits that we issue out, because we don't know at this point, we won't know until October 23, in terms of the changes to regulations, what the Finance Act ultimately we bring in in terms of tax issues uh, and in terms of the uh, government's legislation about dealing with the remedy of the benefits there will be adjustments that need to be made to what we give out now. By choosing this national one, I would hope that the LGA and the fire pensions experts will issue a standard approach for correcting those storage of benefit statements. It's to cover the total cost over the total period. It's not an annual cost. What I've estimated is the 300,000 that we brought in, plus a third of 300, 600,000 pot we've got, because this will not be uh, remedies that go out this year. It's going to continue now, probably up to including 23, 24, possibly beyond. So it's an estimate of the total cost over the total period. And I would assume you're leaving for us to spend more now is that as you started down the 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 I will report through the financial monitoring and quarterly financial monitoring report any change to uh, my forecast costs or any changes that, that, that may give rise to changing the decision and amend the decision. But to be honest, I don't foresee anything now that will change the position because the LGA and FBU, <coughs> excuse me, have now signed this agreement and have indicated in the NMSB that, that both don't see any change about the framework, but they both accept and one's in October 23. <coughs> the legislation comes out or the regulation changes, they will override this framework. So once the legislation and the, uh, the, 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 the regulations are being changed uh, in October 23, they will override the framework and that will give the clear decision over what changes, not just to the by pension scheme the police, but all public pension. It's just we're in a position where there's been an agreement that the five pension scheme we will do the home office uh, guidance give immediate access to the legacy scheme. Yeah, thank you. Following on from my earlier question and discussion since about a period of time, I'd like to formally move that uh, we delete the words consider adopting the first line and insert the word adopt. I think that would clarify it and we that we have to make the decision today. So I'll formally move that to Yes, I'm not exactly too much. Um the 
From a cloud sergeant, it's very complicated, but at the end of the day, it's a legal decision about fullness of equity in treating pensions, and we've got to support that. The argument was about how it's funded. And our claim from the government was that we should be putting money up, which they haven't. But, you know, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. We should support this. Uh, and so the recommendation that I'm hearing is um, support it, identify that money, and then we'll have to report back on implications as we move forward. Some of this is legacy European um, Union, some of it's to do with legal cases action. I mean, we are part of the overall fiction, we just have to do our best. So the recommendation is that, as amended, um, we uh, adopt the LGA and the memorandum to operate the criminal society. Is that agreed, colleagues? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, can I just, just on that note? Oh, sorry. No, 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 it's actually fine. It's a problem. But what we'll bring back is a report of what's in the resources now around it, the, the 300,000 and the kind of commitment to finance for balance in the game. That's okay. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, so now, this is what we came for. Oh, yeah. Fire gloves. <laughs> so, seven, contract award for structural fire gloves. 21521. Yeah, yes, yeah, the reason for doing what basically is that the value of the contract will be 250,000, which requires the lender's approval. The reason why it will be 250,000 is because it's not just framework to say this authority, it's the authorities within the world bank procurement group. The expected spend for this authority would only be between sort of uh, 30 to 40,000 over, over the period. But because we are driving the framework, as we have to bring it back to you to approve the overall value of orders, or more authorities will exceed the amount that officers are allowed to approve of delegated powers. So I receive the members approval to Vote the recommendation of all the framework between to the benefits safety where it was five five times eleven dollars. Okay, any questions on this? Very contentious issue. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the grip hold on. Uh, it's a recommendation, is it agreed? Yeah. Well thank you very much. I I think we've made some very good decisions tonight. I think it's, you know, we look back on these um, uh, as a, a fundamental term in And uh, I have a feeling this is the last authority meeting before Christmas. We may have policy resources, but for those members that we don't see, happy Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs>